it'll be available for you after. Okay. So we have a lot to cover today, and um, I know we've still got some people joining, but it'll take us just a moment to kind of get through some housekeeping and that sort of thing. So we will jump in and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Liz McRae. I'm a co-founder of Village Wealth. We're a technology company based in Calgary, Alberta, and we are in the business of connecting qualified buyers with businesses that are prepared to sell. So what this means is um, that we are, uh, we're a search engine. So this is our team here in Calgary. So when you get emails and notifications from us and you see our activity online, we are real people. Uh, Rob Irwin is our CEO. My name, Liz McRae again, um, head of partnerships. Giselle manages a lot of our sell side um, and our operations. She's who's speaking with a lot of the brokers and M&A firms that we work with and business owners. Josh does our marketing. Um, he's not able to join us right now, but any of the lovely LinkedIn posts that you see all come from Josh. And Mike McDonald is our head of product. So uh, any, any feedback on the product all, all goes to Mike and that sort of thing. And he makes all the magic happen behind the scenes. So today our topic is valuations and changing times. And we're excited to have Scott Duke and Yan Dang here with us today. I'll introduce them in a moment. But I just wanted to cover for anyone new here today, I wanted to go over the the basic functionality of Village Wealth. And we are a business, business buyer search engine. So what that means is anyone that's looking to purchase a company, um, acquire or invest in a company can register their search criteria with Village Wealth. We are a membership subscription for both business purchasers and sellers, making it possible for anyone selling a business to access this search engine of, of business acquirers and investors. As part of our thank you for being here today, we have a special discount on our annual membership. So within the buyer membership includes connections to sellers, M&A um, advisors and business brokers. It includes access to financing and co-investors through the Village Wealth membership, peer support, as well as access to advisory. And it's a 20% off of the annual membership for participating today. So there'll be a membership, there'll be a, sorry, a discount code that's sent out um, in an email after today's session. So watch for that discount code if you're not already a member. And it'll be valid for 48 hours. So membership on the sell side includes access to vetted acquirers within the search engine, financial verification of any of your purchasers, as well as industry reports, and also access to uh, our preferred partners on the advisory side as well. So just some housekeeping for today. I will ask that everyone uh, leaves themselves on mute until the end when we have a bit of time for discussion. You're welcome to put yourself in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from. I believe we have people from Vancouver to Ontario today joining us. So welcome, welcome. Thank you for, your, for sharing your time with us. We'll jump into speaker introductions momentarily. And the way that we're gonna manage it is we have questions prepared for both Yen and Scott. So we'll run through those, those questions, um, bounce back, back and forth between the discussion. And we ask that you please hold some of your questions until the end. We'll hold about 10 minutes at the end for um, audience questions. And then the next event that we have is a member only event. Um, and it's a round table for um, purchasing purchaser purchase members. Um, and it's about due diligence and it'll be held on April 19th. So if you have any questions about that, um, please feel free to um, email us or um, if you're a subscribing member, you'll get a notification for the invitation of that. All right. Wow. Jumping into things. So today we have with us uh, business valuator Yen Dang. She's based here in Calgary, Alberta. And we have M&A advisor Scott Duke, who's based in Revelstoke. And with that, I'm just going to let you guys jump into things. And I will also, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see more of your faces and less of my slides. And then uh, we're just going to roll right into uh, Q&A. Do you want me to go ahead, uh, Scott? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Yen, ladies first. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Yen Dang. I am the founder of Aspen Valuations, um, a business valuation firm established in 2017. Uh, so we are a team of five members uh, based in Calgary and Vancouver. 
We specialize in performing business valuations for small and medium-sized businesses uh, in a range of sectors. Um, our valuations are done for different purposes. For um, a lot of that is for purchase and sale of businesses or financing loan, um, shareholder by L or by in transaction. Um, we also perform valuations for dispute and litigation, uh, such as in a divorce or shareholder dispute or lawsuit, um, also for income tax purposes. Um, I myself been um, practicing business valuations since 2008. Uh, I am a charter business valuator and a charter accountant. Thank you, Yen. No. Wonderful to have you here today. Thank you. Scott, yeah, jump no, in. Absolutely. Liz, happy to be here. I love the Village Well team. That's why I'm here. I love everything you guys do. And uh, I see Josh has joined in. He had your badge there. He's double duty. <laughs> you know? So good to, good to see you. And Giselle and Rob, thanks so much. Always happy to be involved. So my background's a little bit different. I am less academic. I'm more entrepreneurial. So I've had a handful of companies. I'm from Mississauga, Ontario. So I started my entrepreneurial journey kind of outside of Toronto. Uh, but I had six businesses before I left Ontario. And then uh, out here in BC, I now live in British Columbia in Revelstoke, which nobody knows where this is unless they watch The Art of Flight or are into snowboarding or skiing. But uh, either way, that's why I'm here. I'm kind of a bit of a ski bum, but uh, it's a, a life choice, I suppose. But we run a small M&A firm out of uh, Revelstoke. There's seven team members and we service, we actually service all of North America. So we do some work in the United States as well. Uh, for those of you that are in this network that are on the buy side or on the sell side, there's actually a fair bit of transaction happening between the US and Canada as people move money to a more stable place that is Canada. So uh, it's, it's kind of nice to see that as a Canadian. Uh, but yeah, that's what I do day to day is we help business owners transition their companies or help people that are looking to acquire businesses find uh, new opportunities. And a lot of the, there's a lot of valuation that happens with that, whether it's on the buy side or the sell side. So I'm really excited to have the discussion today. Perfect. Thanks, Scott. Thanks again for those those great intros. Um, and just for some context today, our audience is a really a nice blend today of people who are purchasing businesses. We've got a few business owners on the call that are selling. We've got a mixture of M and A firms. I think we've got a few banks joining us today uh, and lawyers. We've got a good mixture of advisors, buyers, and sellers today. So we'll try and keep it relatively generic. Um, we're going to be jumping into kind of more of the factors that are impacting things right now. Um, over the last few years. So um, if, if this is new, if valuation terminology is new to you, um, we will be kind of going back to basics in a few of the questions, but um, there is a general assumption that everyone here kind of has a general knowledge of, of the basics of valuation. So um, and jumping in with that and starting, um, Yen, I'm going to start with you. And, and really, you know, one of the most common questions that we hear in, in valuation um, more recently is, you know, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted valuations and how do you see this evolving in the future? Uh, sure. So valuation involves um, analyzing historical performance as well as projections. Um, but what we've seen with the impact of COVID is that um, there are there have been significant fluctuations um, in operating results um, due to COVID for some years. Um, so the question is, if it's COVID related, should we normalize the impact or is it going to be a permanent trend? Uh, for example, there might be changes in consumer behaviors, for example, automation. Um, so that really, that trend really helped help technology companies. Um, so you can see the, um, the, the, the jump in revenue and, and operations for these technology company, but that will stay because that, kind of created a trend um, and some some impact might be um, new products, new expansion. Um, another challenge that we have is that when we perform market approach by looking at the comparable transactions, um, we see that in some sectors, there are way more fewer transactions due to use for our analysis than pre-COVID. Um, and even then with those transactions, we have to ask the question, um, what's behind these transactions? Is that a distressed sale or not? Because if it is, it might not be a good benchmark to use. 
Thank you, Yan. Yeah, certainly, um, certainly the normalizations and, and, and the trends in technology moving toward these adaptations that came out of COVID and this, you know, a lot of businesses having to pivot and, and, and change their trajectory. And, and in all of that is, is this going to continue or is it going to go back to pre-COVID or is this moving into the future? Is it sustainable into the future? Scott, what are you, what are you seeing in, in your world? And um, again, like Yan coming from more of the academic approach, but also um, involved in some advisory as well in transactions but Scott you see you see things kind of at, at the table of negotiations at the final hour being more involved in the transaction itself so yeah interested in, in seeing the impacts that you've seen from COVID yeah I think COVID it's honestly it's impacted every single deal that we've done there's not a there's not a deal that doesn't happen that people don't have that discussion around what impact did COVID have on this business so for those of you that are kind of on the sell side that are out there and you had your best year coming out of COVID, which, which by the way, people thought that COVID was a negative impact, but on the whole, there was a lot of positive impact from COVID for a lot of businesses. Uh, we're doing valuation work right now on a logistics company and logistics, the whole industry, just COVID just backlogged everything until the 2021 year. So everybody in that industry saw a massive spike. In 2021. Uh, so what, what happens is Deller wants to sell on the high and they're setting, they're trying to set expectations that, you know, this is going to carry forward into the future and the buyer's not so naive to think that's going to happen. So then there ends up just being friction at, at that point of conversation. Right. Uh, and really it's, it, we're kind of, we aren't completely through COVID, but we're pretty darn close because you, most companies have a recent financial year that is outside of the COVID environment. Uh, so now what valuators are doing, at least what we're doing is we're looking pre COVID and we're saying, okay, 2019, what was this business doing? Post COVID, what's this business doing? All right, fine. Are those years pretty similar? And just negating everything that happened during the COVID period. And buyers are doing the same thing as well because you were either up or you were down, but it's not going to continue in the future. It was a complete anomaly. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Scott. That's yeah. uh, very concise. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of going back to basics, Scott, I'll, I'll stay with you for a second. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what are the key values just for, for anyone who is coming in with an entry level knowledge, the key the key drivers for build business values that um, that your, your bench may yeah. be I mean, I don't have, this doesn't have to come directly from me. I ran a session back in 21. We had like 30 M&A people on it. And so I, I posed a similar question to all of them. Cash flow. <laughs> Cash flow is the biggest driver, right? Like how much how much is the business driving now? And what's the probability of that that cash flow being driven into the future? That's really what it is. And so buyers are trying to determine, all right, you know, we can see historically what you've done. We can try and project this into the future by the riskiness of your business. So th then it kind of becomes a question of risk. Like what is the riskiness of this asset under new ownership? Like that that's the big thing that I think sometimes people don't think about. This new buyer actually brings a lot brings a lot of risk or will reduce the risk in your business depending on who they are. So if you're uh, selling a smaller company where you're an owner operator, that new buyer is a if they have less operational experience than you, they're going to bring more risk to the table. Uh, we had a business that we sold earlier in the year and uh, in Vancouver and it was a quite a good, it's like $300,000 in EBITDA, like steady Eddie, like all the way through. And the new buyer just didn't have the operation experience and has been losing money since ever, since they bought it. Well, that's risk changed because of that buyer, right? So that, I mean, the biggest thing that people want to know is, okay, what, you know, what are the big things that we're looking at in our company? Owner dependence. That's like hands down, probably the biggest one. If your company is dependent on yourself, then, you know, you're going to get dinged a little bit from a risk perspective. Uh, another big one is customer concentration. This always comes up. So if you have one key customer, like we were selling a distribution, an oil distribution firm, and they they just their only customer was CP. So if CP decided not to use them, they're done, right? So customer concentration, if that gets above fifteen percent, that could becomes a risk, and you might not be sellable or your value will be dropped. Uh, and and there's a there's forty three that we look at, but those are two big ones. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Scott. Any anything to add there, Ian, on uh, on business value drivers? Uh, yes, no, I think I agree with Scott. Um, one of the things that we um, we all also look at is the the state, you know, how stable the cash flow is, you know, revenue up and down. Um, with COVID, it's harder, you know, you you just have to expand that. But um, from perspective of a purchaser, they want um, a solid uh, um, you know, history of of cash flow, positive cash flow, and you know. Um, sales um, growth in sales each year, so that would um, that would be like 
boost, boosting the business value quite significantly. And Yan, what are some other factors that it, in our current times with what's been going on in the economy right now um, and you know, coming out of COVID, but what are some of the other core factors that are really impacting business valuation right now that maybe in years past haven't haven't been as as dominant but but you know as far as you know we're seeing things in labor we're seeing you know interest rates fluctuate what are what are these kind of core factors that you're seeing right now that are really really playing a role yeah we do see the impact of inflation uh, significantly let's say a quarter or two um before this but now it seems to be going down um and you know with the the cost of capital we going back to cut up using the input of long term projection like 3% uh, rather than it's 7 um last month or so um but but it does have an impact on cost um um, for a lot of businesses, their revenue might be going up, but not fast enough to, to cover the, the increase mm. increases in cost. So that might impact the profitability. Um, interest rate it, it, it does impact the ability of companies to uh, to borrow. Um, what we see is technology companies had no problem, no issue raising or borrowing money in, in the past. And now that's not the case anymore. So that might have some impact in there. Um, but what is, uh, I think more significant is the possibility of recession in 2023 um, that impacts certain sectors more than others. For example, we see cutback in corporate spending and that might have, um, like a some impact in other sectors such as consulting um construction is starting to see some some impact um mm -hmm. so yeah so if any sector that might be impacted by construction slow down or economy slow down then we need to assess that the risk mm. Uh, that makes a good point on construction and service-based companies and the labor trends that are happening right now. Scott, you have a concentration um, in construction with the businesses that you focus on. What are you seeing as, as factors that are impacting business valuation and start starting with the labor one? Yeah, I mean, you nailed it. Late, labor's, labor is going to be a challenge moving forward for probably the remainder of my life until we have more automation from, I don't know, what's the de Boston dynamics actually gets people out on job sites, right, or robots out on job sites. And that's because every entrant that we have into the marketplace from an employment perspective, 14 leave uh, as the, as baby boomers. So it's, there's just, we aren't replacing as quickly as people are leaving. And so that, that trend is, we're selling an HR recruitment firm right now, actually, and that, I mean, it's a bit of a tailwind for them. Uh, but it's it's going to be a challenge moving forward. The upside of that for those people that have businesses that are stable and have an employment a, a stable employment base is that people are acquiring just for the employees. So that's that's one thing that you can really push when you're going to market to sell. If you have built into your company good good employee retention programs, then that's a major a major value enhancement opportunity for you from cash to close perspective because people are looking for staff and it may be the only way to get them. Um, so that it, for sure, that's what I would comment on the employment side of things on the what I'd like to drive home for people on this call is that there is no more the biggest driver of, of value in your business is the cost of capital. That's the big that's the biggest one. So because the cost of capital has changed so dramatically in the last call it six months, uh, it has reduced the value of businesses without question. And I don't think we're going back to the low interest rates that we had historically. Uh, that's just a reality is in San Diego in November. And I was talking to a guy from Live Oak Bank and they, I said, what are you stress testing things at right now as far as interest rates go? And they were stress testing things and stress testing. So, you know, interest rates were at three and a half percent. He's like, we we're stress testing at six. He's like, we're stress testing now between 11 and 12%. So that's the bank. So they're not lending money on deals unless they can see a return at those kind of at those kind of rates. And that was in November. And we've had a couple of bumps since then, right? So this is this is a major for us in our industry. And we've had a couple of deals die because of it. But if you look back to Q4 of 2022, MA Source puts in a report and the number one deal, deal killer in that quarter was seller expectations were off. And that's partially because 
interest rates were low. So they were set and pegged at those rates. And we're seeing this in housing as well, but they were set at those higher rates, at low, lower interest rates and higher valuations. Uh, and that was taking them a time to adjust. So Q4 killed a lot of deals in Q4. And uh, the other one, the other big one was, um, what was the other uh, big one? Q4? I'm forgetting what the, what the second biggest one in Q4, in Q4 was, uh, but interest rates were certainly high up there. So. Thanks, Matt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All, all very real. And just for anyone who's watching the recording on this, um, we are recording in March of 2023, in case you're watching this two years from now and things have changed, just a yeah. of date perspective. Um, yeah. And <laughs> hopefully they're um, watching it and interest rates <laughs> came down a little bit just for to make my life easier and same with the end. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we'll put that manifestation out there. Yeah. Goodbye. Um, and so we've seen a lot of, uh, coming back to the labor piece too, you know, a lot of companies are still, you know, doing remote work and, um, you know, different, depending on, on the structure of the company and, and, and the workplace scenario. Um, How is, what's, what about the impact of remote work um, and the other changes in the workplace of val for value on business? Yen? Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know about you, Scott, but I don't see a, a huge impact um, except for some companies. Um, now they see that they are, um, equipped to, to leverage um, new shore or offshore workforce. So that helped them expand and scale uh, quite nicely. And some industry that we work with, they have limited option to for remote work. Um, they had to be in person. We talked about construction, people had to be on site. Um, and for the industry where remote work works well, they already implemented um, some degree of, of that like way before COVID. So it, it's not like a, I don't see a, a huge major impact on violations. Yeah, okay. I, I think I agree. I mean, it's not going to uh, be a major impact from a valuation perspective. The, the takeaway on this is that if you're if you have low turnover in your team, then that is going to be perceived as low risk for a potential acquirer, which is going to increase your value. And it it is if you can in your business at this date make it so that there's a little bit more flexibility around remote work. Like I hear of organizations that, that are forcing people back to the office and, you know, you lose staff in that respect because they've got, they've got kind of got addicted to working at home a little bit. So you want to give them that option and that will help with retention and, and that will help with your increasing the value of your business. So I think that's probably the way to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with you there, Scott, too, is, is you know, with these changing times that we're in, you know, retention and flexibility is is kind of what the workforce trends that we're seeing that that the workforce is is wanting and, and requiring from companies to, you know, otherwise, you know, it's not just, you know, who's who's paying the highest salary, it's who's who's providing flexibility and the and um the options and coming into retention and, and value on the on the company. Um, you know, that that turnover rate is and, and churn rate of employment is something that acquirers are looking at. Um, so jumping jumping into a different kind of topic here, um, as far as forecasting, and, and it kind of comes back to the interest rates too, but how, how important right now is, is the forecasting um, in valuations um, as, as well? And that plays, plays into the financing as well. Uh, Scott, I'll, I'll leave that one with, with you first. Yeah, I don't know. How important is the crystal ball, right? How can we, how well can we predict the future? Every buyer is going to do the best job they can to do it to do that, and they're going they are going to. So this is this is real world. This is what they do. Uh, they project their future optimistically because they wouldn't be buying the company if they didn't think they could grow it into the future. So they're going to do their own projections, uh, but where they're they're going to hammer you as much as much as they possibly can on how poorly you did in the past. So that's that's just how it how it goes, right? Like that's that's the real world. So what we want is you want to be whether you're doing the work yourself or you're working with someone like Yan or myself, you want to be setting up a future projection that's realistic, that's targets that you can hit, uh, and is explainable. That's because you and then you're going to be in the negotiation. You're going to be pushing that buyer as much as you possibly can be to those future projections because they're usually they usually are the most rosy and optimistic, right? Like you're selling the blue sky at the end of the day. Uh, but they have to be realistic. And then the the risk here is if you try, if you put a projection that is unrealistic because you want to use that projection to increase and kind of buffer the value of your company upwards, uh, the, the risk of that is that you don't hit those numbers. So what ends up happening, because when you're actually in a sale process, the sale process takes anywhere between six to 12 months, 
the projections you did are slowly going to start becoming reality. So if you aren't hitting those numbers that you set out, that is going to erode value in your business probably faster than anything else because like, hey, you said these numbers you were going to hit and now you aren't hitting them. So obviously the company is not worth what you said. So we're reducing our purchase price. So you just want to set projections that are realistic and that you can actually hit. Thanks, Scott. Again, to you, how important are the financial forecasting right now and valuations? Yeah, I, I find that uh, forecasting is uh, um, it, it's increasingly more important than before. In the past, we have uh, these businesses where they are very mature and stable. So past historical performance might be indicative of what you would expect going forward. Um, but now it's... Um, my recommendation is to do a forecast. You know, it doesn't have to be an extensive 10 year forecast, but three solid, uh, three year um, solid forecast is gonna help um, make the valuation more accurate and, and reliable. And, and also the cost structure as well, right? There's a lot of changes pivoting um, over the past two years. So it might change um, the cost structure of the business as well. So. Um, well, you know, the margin of 8% of the past might not be the same going forward. Question for you both, when you're, when you're doing your valuations, is it, is a requirement of the, the seller, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're doing the valuation for the seller, is it, is it the seller's responsibility to provide those, that forecasting for you as part of the valuation, um, because and and the reason I asked you is because we have a purchaser right now and there aren't there aren't for, um, forecasted statements, um, but the banks are requiring them for their financing. So you know what are you guys seeing? Are you see, guys seeing that the sell side is preparing the forecast or that uh, the purchasers are doing it, um, or, or a little bit of both? Sorry, yeah. start with you, Yen. Uh, so we have a, a a couple of clients right now. They are. Um, so, so one comes to mind is a daycare, a couple of days care actually on the go. Um, and, and it's, it's the, the bank, they need the financing loan too. The bank didn't ask for the, the forecast, um, but you know, daycare, you have capacity limits. So it's not like you can grow 15%, 20% or so. I can see why the bank didn't ask for that. Um, but, um, uh, but usually, some a lot of sellers that we deal with they they do prepare some sort of forecast and then that would be included in our valuation report perfect scott what about you yeah so i'm in a master's group this m a master's group to the ibba actually liz you were at the ibba conference the last one that they ran which was good and so there's about 35 of us in that and they they posed a similar question because we were going through and doing evaluation day uh, and they asked how many people are putting together forecasts seller forecasts and presenting those to the buyer uh, and it was 90 percent of the group there was only a couple people in the group that weren't doing that work the reason why the few that weren't doing the work were they were saying we don't want to set expectations that can't be hit uh, and we think the buyer should be putting their own forecasts together fine uh, the rest of the group, the 90%, the vast majority of them were putting the putting forecasts together and, and we put forecasts together because I think it's better to set expectations than have a buyer just presume and, and guess to what's going on. And the seller themselves has the best idea and the best handle on their business of what it's doing today and what it's going to do in the future. And I think if you sit down with a seller and actually go through kind of line by line of their business and really do a, a, a deeper audit on it, you can get a pretty good idea of what's going to happen into the future. And then you can sell that and you can sell that future, which I ta already talked to about, you know, the importance of selling the blue sky of the future, because uh, that'll increase increase your cash at close. Uh, so I'm, I'm on the camp that you put it together and you stand behind it, but you make sure that when you're putting it together, it's realistic and, and you can, you know, you, you, there's no fabrication. Like you, the last thing you want to do in a transaction that has anything that would be even close to considered a lie or stretching the truth. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks for, thanks for that. Thanks for, for both of you. Cause we do have lots of purchasers that are, that are going for bank financing and, and, you know, sometimes, sometimes the forecasting is already done or sometimes, you know, it, it's not. And then they're left going, well, well, you know, is it the seller or, or is it myself? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, being put in this position to, to either ask for it or do it themselves. So thank, thanks for your feedback on it. That's great. Um, I'm wondering if, if, 
you know, demand in some industries, there's some industries that are just super hot right now and getting rolled up and um, lots of activity um, and consolidation in sectors is demand in some in industries impacting valuations in other sectors. Again, I'll start with you. Sorry, demand. Um, yeah, we see that the impact can be um, significant or subtle depending on the industries. Um, going back to construction again, right? Um, might so it might not be. Um, you know, when when there is a boom, um, you we see that a lot of sectors around construction, such as manufacturing of construction materials or professional services such as engineering or architecture businesses um, um, got very busy and doing very well. And vice versa, when we in kind of recession or slow down, um, these uh, sectors can be um, impacted quite significantly as well. And what sectors, I know I'll ask because I know that there's probably lots of people wondering what, what sectors are you are you you both seeing where there is is more demand right now for those sec those sectors is there is there yeah, kind of a common in. pattern that you're seeing sorry scott yeah. and it, i mean people want to know what those exact sectors are i mean you guys would have some data on that at village wealth and then there's some other organizations that publish data on what industry sectors are have the most activity per quarter uh, industrial and manufacturing is it's always pretty good to be honest with you. The reason why that is is because private equity firms, industry buyers, they can put capital to work pretty quickly in manufacturing plants to scale a business. And if it's already set up, adding another plant or you know adding another line shift or just in injecting more capital in is an easy way for them to scale these businesses. Uh, so they always do relatively well. Uh, SaaS and anything that has a recurring revenue model is always doing really well because that's attractive to people, uh, even industries like property management that have that contracted revenue security businesses people love because it has contracted revenue janitorial services people love because it has contracted revenue on the commercial side. Uh, so basically, people are looking for stuff that has stable, predictable revenue, and they choose industries because of that. Uh, there's a lot of data for those out there that are interested in knowing like which an industry candidate actually has some of this data, but there's also data on business valuation resources or business reference guide that shows the multiples in each industry, average multiples. But it's very curious. Like if you go to the, and just, and we've done this at Open Road, like we've just done a cross section of the entire Canadian economy by next code, but we've looked to see which ones sell at the highest multiples. And it is kind of all over the map. Uh, and, and industry is a big driver of that. Uh, so when we look at and we do our valuation work, we're looking at the industry, that's part of what we do. And then we also look at what's hot and what's not, which is crazy to think of it, but it, there's trends in acquiring businesses, just like there's trends in clothing, right? So some things are big now and won't be big later. And that is a, that is a tailwind that some industries see. And because there's competitive forces out there to buy these assets, their valuations go up. Uh, so it's a component of it without question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and speaking of the, the competition in certain sectors, Yen, um, I'll go back to you. Like from your perspective, how are you seeing buyer competition impacting business value? Yeah. So uh, interestingly, yeah, SaaS is one of the uh, sector that we do a lot of valuations for. And of course, with automation. And um, so they're doing very well. Their multiples went through the roof. It's recently just slowing down, just very recently. Um, and interestingly, we saw a lot of uh, interest in daycare uh, businesses uh, from Alberta to BC. Um, we involved in a, a few transactions like that. And, and uh, from what I know, there are a lot of bidders for, for these businesses um, that were put up for sale. And uh, so, are, sorry? It could, it could be due to the, the boom in population. Um, you know, uh, so there's a lot of demand for daycare businesses. The, yeah, the daycare and one, I'll jump on that because the daycare yeah. one I actually would have no knowledge of if it wasn't for the fact that I have a two and a half year old daughter who just entered daycare. But there's been a lot of new government grant programs that come out that are subsidizing parents, which is driving more demand. And then, yeah, so that's probably that might be part of it too. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, I'll stick with you, Scott, on this buyer competition, this competitive market, because we, we're, we're certainly seeing more buyers come into the market um, for acquisitions at Village Wealth. And so um, where, where 
there was sort of an understanding or an expectation of value, you know, prior to going to market. And then, and then what are you seeing for buyer competition? And I mean, it would be vary by sector, but um, how is, how is buyer, you know, at the deal table, how is buyer competition impacting business value? Yeah, right. we have, there, there is data on that and it's, at last quarter and the quarter before it started to shift a little bit. So the, the, the question is, is it a buyer's market or is it a seller's market? And I mean, the big takeaway that I can give people on this is that as you cross that threshold of a business where you are earning and, and people may or may not know the acronym EBITDA, so I'll just say earnings. But if you get to the point where you have earnings that are above a million dollars a year, then you break into this threshold, you break into this category that is almost always a seller's market. Because there's so much demand on the private equity side, the industry buyers that, and there's such little supply of businesses that have actually reached that scale, that if you get there, you can comfortably assume that you are going to be able to be competitive and be able to push up your price by having multiple bidders coming to your door. Now, if you're below that mark, which by the way, uh, that, it, that represents below that mark of a million dollars in earnings represents 98% of the businesses in the Canadian marketplace. So there, the, the likelihood is that you're below that. That's fine. But as you slowly drop more below that, it ends up being a buyer, a, a, the buyer's market and you start to lose a little bit of power in the negotiation because there's just more supply of businesses that are of that size. This is probably the best way that I can answer that. That's a great answer. That makes a lot of sense, Scott. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, and I want to come back to the interest rate. Um, and we touched on it a little bit. Yeah, and thank you for, for your input on that. But I'm going to come back to that again, um, more succinctly is how are interest rates impacting valuations right now? Uh, so it definitely uh, caused cost of capital to go up or else it's equal interest rate will result in a higher cost of capital um, or a lower business value. Uh, but that said, it depends on the market as well. The intra, um, the uh, as we said, buyer market or seller market, and the industry. Uh, going back to SaaS again, um, their multiples went through the roof even during the time when interest rate story is already rising, um, and it only slowing down like the last quarter or so. Scott. Yeah, I, I, the 30,000 on foot view on this one is just think about how a transaction happens from an acquisition perspective is where the where the capital comes from. So standard, standard sale, you know, 30% buyer has down payment. So they've saved up that money, whether, you know, small buyer, big buyer, they're going to put some of their own money into the into the game, then the rest of it is going to be financed somehow. So it's going to be financed from a banking institution, or it's going to be a private financing, or it's going to have some bit of a vendor note. But the vast majority of your transaction value is usually through debt. Uh, and if you look at, okay, so I want to sell my business for you know three million dollars. Well, now a good like two called two million ish, and that's not exact, but two million is going to be on a on a some kind of debt instrument, right? If your interest rate changes from three to ten percent that dramatically impacts what a purchaser can pay for your business. So what does it do? It, it drops the value of the company. And unfo like, unfortunately, that's just the math of it. Like we can do is, and, and I'm an entrepreneur long before I'm in, in the M&A space, we can do all that we can do to reduce the riskiness of our business, increase cash flow, uh, increase revenues. Like we can hustle away and, and work. But if that cost of capital is high, it doesn't change the, the math and doesn't change the fundamentals of the acquirer having to, pay more on a monthly basis and it'll reduce the value of our company sadly that's just it and i'm gonna i'm gonna stay with you here so in our in your last answer we we've been you know you had pointed out that you know it's more competitive a million in earnings and over is more competitive and you're dealing with private equity and different sources of capital so would you say that the interest rates are have more of an impact on business value for companies that do have under a million in earnings hundred percent. I would agree with that statement because I say the five hundred thousand dollar in earning mark. I say that's where the door to the private capital markets kind of starts to creep open. At a million dollars, that's where it, it's really open. You can walk through it, and anything above that, it's wide open, right? So, and and again, like not 
not many of us make it there. That's a tough, that's a tough slog to get to build a company of that size. Uh, but below that threshold, the buyer that's coming to the table is likely someone who's going to step into your shoes and be an owner operator. And at that size, they're probably going to bring $100,000 or $150,000. It's kind of what I find is common when we're selling smaller Main Street businesses is that people have saved up, you know, 150, 200K to purchase a business. And the rest of it, they're using some debt instrument uh, that they're borrowing from a bank. And so, yes, so to answer your question, Liz, yeah, this, if it's a smaller business, then the interest rates are likely going to affect it a little bit more, where if it's larger, you may be, may be private funds that are acquiring the company and they're less affected by what the traditional banking institutions are doing. And I suspect this debt, because of the, the interest rate trend has only really happened in the last few months, the data from these comparable sales, like comparatively, and again, I'll, I'll go to you for this question as well. Um, you know, relying on comparable market trends, you know, six months ago, and, and as the data becomes more available, um, is this impacting seller expectations too, when, when comparatively looking at, you know, what their, their sale multiples were six to nine months ago, or a year ago versus now, like, are these expectations being tapered at the deal table because interest rates are only being impacted, you know, more recently? Would, like, yeah. do you have any comments on that, Yen? Yeah, some some industry we we can verify enough transactions to compare the movement of interest, the impact of, of interest rates. Um, but we do compare year by year, and um, as Scott said, and looks like the bigger companies they always trade, uh, they are traded at larger multiples. And um, so far, based on the industry that we we looked at, we worked on um, on a couple of valuations. Um, the larger ones, the multiples seem not to be impacted more as significantly as the, the, the smaller companies. That makes sense. That makes sense. And so with, with, you know, what's going on with interest rates and access to capital, how is that bringing in different deal structures and earnouts right now? And what's your opinion on the different creative structures that are that are available and, and are happening are, are you seeing more creative structures and more earnouts more vendor financing right now um interested to hear both of your perspectives on that um scott do you want to take that one first yeah yeah no that's fine yeah we ha we have a i mean one guy limited data set like on any on any given day an m a firm is going to sell 20 companies a year if they're really performing well. Uh, so that, so I can speak from the experience of the deals that we have in the marketplace. Uh, yeah, we're, what we're trying to do, because our objective is to sell the companies that we work with. Uh, so we're, what we're trying to do is position these firms so that they can go after, call it the bigger fish that have the capital already in play and have the capital that they've already secured. Uh, so they're, they aren't as affected by what's happening outside from an interest rate perspective and the diff like difficulty of getting a loan from a bank at this point. That's that's kind of the way to play the game as, as it is right now. But I, 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 Liz, can you repeat the question again? Because I started getting on a tangent there. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I do that. Just yeah. with, uh, with, with current, current trends impacting yeah. business value, uh, what's your opinion on the use of, of creative deal structures? Oh, yeah, creative deal structure. Yeah, yeah, here's the thing. Everyone has to expect that their deal is not going to be cash at all cash at close. We've done one or two deals that were all cash at close. They're, they're less common than... The deal structure that I spoke about earlier. You know, you're going to have some kind of vendor note involved with it. Uh, you're going to have some kind of earnout. We're doing an earnout deal right now. I I hate earnouts and sellers hate earnouts. And for the most part, to be honest with you, when we talk to private equity firms and buyers, they don't really love earnouts either. Uh, but they they are coming into play more because of the. And, and if you've heard about it, you've never heard of what an earnout is before. An earnout is basically the seller says my company is worth three million bucks. The buyer says, okay, no, your company's worth two because of changing trends and recession on the horizon and all the rest of this. And so there's a million dollar gap there. Uh, so what ends up happening, and it won't be the full million dollars. I'm just using this for like an example purposes. But uh, in the negotiation, they'll say, okay, fine. If you hit this number in the future that you say you're going to hit, then we'll release that million dollars. If you don't, then we won't. That's what an earnout is. Is that you basically have to hit a certain threshold and then an earnout releases. Nobody likes it on the sell side because it's risk. Like that cash is at risk the entirety of the time. But what it does do is it does allow a bridge to be a, a gap, the gap to be filled by a bridge. And if you do hit your numbers, then you you know you get those value you get the 
top dollar that you're trying to achieve. Uh, we have a deal right now that has a heavy earnout. It's 50% 50, 50 of the transactions in earnout. And because, all right, fine, it's in a risk. There's a lot of risk elements to do with this business, the primary one being owner dependence. And so if that performance doesn't happen, they don't get paid. Uh, it does incentivize the owner to get the work done, you know, so that just, you know, that happens. And then the other one that you see is is common is a vendor note. And people dislike vendor notes as well, because ven all a vendor note is, is using the same numbers, I'm going to get my $2 million cash at close and a million dollars is going to get paid out over a period of time. And there's going to be some kind of interest bearing uh, note attached to that. So you'll get it at 5% or you'll get it at 8% or whatever it might be and what's negotiated, but it comes to you over a period of three, four, five years. And again, sellers don't like that because they always want their cash to close. But the reality is most deals, like 70% of deals have these different kinds of instruments in them so that that risk can be shared between the buyer and the seller. Um, the other one that people don't know about, and, and I'd like to speak to a little bit, is be, that they're always hesitant of, but depending on the size of your company and the partner that acquires you, uh, they can use a stock rollover. So basically, you know, call it 20% of the stock of your company that you don't get paid out on. It just rolls into the parent company and that's buying you. If the parent company that's buying you, and you can easily look at that and go, hey, this thing's going to grow because they're amalgamating a whole bunch of business, uh, these businesses in the same industry. There's, a, I've seen sellers of ours that we've worked with that have made more money on their 20% five years down the line when the whole entity sells versus what they made on the 80% when they sold their business in the first place. So that that's an instrument that gets used as well. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw it out because it's actually a pretty good one, depending on who buys you. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks for thanks for adding that, Scott. Uh, Yen um, and Latif, I do see your question. I'm gonna I'm gonna come to you after. I'm gonna give Yen the opportunity to provide her opinion on on earnouts and structures right now. Um, what are you What are you seeing, or what's your opinion on the on the use of them, Yen? Yeah, so it, it's very common, um, um, and it's helpful to bridge the um, the gap uh, up between expectation between the seller and the buyer, such as the revenue level or even the level that Scott talked about. Um, but um, it's, you know, it could be just to ensure the seller to stay on for like two, three years to ensure smooth transition. So they pay part of the, the proceeds is like a consulting payout package. Um, now with, you know, the interest rate rising, um, and sometimes the earn out um, might have very complex structure with lots of restrictions. Um, so it may be worthwhile for um, seller to um, engage someone like myself or Scott to like figure out what what the value of that earn out would be because you know with the like a three year payout with lots of restriction, it may be worth a, a lot less than than a cash payout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was cer certainly recommended to have advisory support while structuring these these terms and scenarios. Um, we have a question from Latif, and so we've got nine minutes left on the clock here. So if anyone else has questions that they'd like to pose to Yen or Dang, Yen or um, Scott, uh, please put them in the chat now. And we'll get started with Latif. Um, so Latif is asking, are the proportions um, of vendor financing and earnouts shifting? Scott or Yang, whoever. Know, you know, shifting. Yeah. Okay. So we're still in an environment where we're dealing with deals that were negotiated months ago. So we're trying to hold those terms that were pre-negotiated. Uh, but I, I can confidently say that it's going to shift, like without question, there's going to be more shifting to vendor note, there's going to be more shifting to earn out, it's just the way it is. And that's the only, those are the major, the two instruments that we have, whether they're, I mean, they're kind of blunt instruments, but they're what we have to still maximize the value for our seller. So they're just going to be used more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yen, would would you? Yeah, we we don't um, we don't see a significant change in uh, the buy and sell of uh, small and private companies. Um, but we do a lot of valuation for a private a couple of private equity firms, um, mostly for financial purposes, um, and uh, we don't see they have the typical way of structuring the earn out. Um, we, we haven't seen significant changes yet, but that might come. 
Thank you. Thank you both on that one. Um, again, this is kind of the final call for questions from participants. So we have, you know, two very skilled valuators here. If you've got questions, please ask them now. Uh, Mike is asking, Scott, he's asking a little bit about your fee structure here. How do you, as an M&A advisor on your, on your closing fees, how do you get paid on an earnout? Do you get paid as, um, and let me know if you're not comfortable answering. Yeah, I'm comfortable. That, but... I'm always comfortable. <laughs> yeah. My, my whole surprising. job is dealing with conflict. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. well, I'll let you take this. How do you get paid on, on an yeah. earnout co compensation? Do you get paid at close or do you get paid when they when the seller gets paid? Yeah, for sure. I Mike, I'd highly recommend that there is a M and A fee guide that they put out every single year, and it's a uh, Divestopedia partnered with Firmax. Firmax. Yeah, they put that guide out, and we have a link, we have a link to it on o the Open Road website in our resources section, and I also have a link on our site that talks that I do a video that walks through the what the fees are that M and A professionals charge because it is all over the map. And you'll see that when you kind of look at the m and fee guide, it's everywhere. So I would, it's probably 50-50 though, if I kind of think about the fee guide and like going through it, if people will charge on the earnout, even though it hasn't happened, or if they'll wait to that earnout actually being received to then charge fees on it, everybody's a little bit different. Uh, it depends for us. It depends on the size of the transaction. If we're working with a smaller business, for instance, the one that I just spoke to today, that was, you know, 50% was in an earnout. We're actually getting paid on the value of the earnout prior to close or at closing. Uh, and it, but if it was a bigger deal, then that would probably be negotiated a little bit. And, and we'd be happy to do that, right? Because a lot of M&A firms are looking for minimum fees. Like they, if they can't hit their minimum fees, then you know they're they're going to get as close to the minimum fee as they possibly can. If they've already reached that threshold of minimum fees, then there's you know usually some room for negotiation. And then I would also say that if you're dealing, if you have a larger company, there's always room for negotiation. Like so, yeah, like push your M&A advisor on their fees, even if it's me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's opened the he's opened the door yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, question from Barry here. Yeah, and I'll ask you. Um, and again changes depending on the industry, of course, but are you seeing EBITDA, mul EBITDA multiples increasing post COVID? Uh, that's, that's for sure, because during COVID, um, I think it depends on what, it, it's hard to define a COVID period, um, but if you're talking about 2020, um, multiple was, was depressed. And if you look at the market transaction, there are not many to compare with, and some were actually uh, sold um, as a distress sale. Um, yeah, so definitely it's going up. Scott, do you have an opinion on, on that? Multiples post-COVID? Are they going? Yeah, they going I don't up? know. I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> want to disagree. I, I don't have the crystal ball. I can't tell, but I just want people to understand that multiples are so closely tied to the cost of capital that it's it's easy to push a multiple up when you can get a loan at 2%. Pe can, people can pay more because their, you know, the cost of their cash is just that much less. And so that drives a multiple up. I don't, I can't see what's going to happen in, into the future. The big one that I can't see that I don't know, it, but I know is going to have some kind of impact on the market without question is the baby boomers. And the baby boomers have just held back on selling their businesses. Be, like that. Everyone retires at 65 if they're an employee and they probably retired earlier than that. And the stats on that from StatsCan are very strong. It's like 65, you're an employee, you are out. Whereas uh, business owners usually hang on until 67, 68. And we're working with, I have a business owner I'm working with who's 76. Like they just keep on hanging on, right? And they've hung on a little bit through COVID because they had to carry the ball through the COVID period. And that's, you know, put two more years onto their clock. And so this is building a big, a big bucket of businesses that have transition. And I know the business advisors have been talking about this for ages, but I think that the, the wave is actually here. Like most of the conversations that I have with people are they're exiting because they need to retire and they're in their 70s. So I don't know what that's going to do to the market. All I know is it's going to increase the amount that's available, which is going to increase supply. And I don't know what's going to happen with demand. So we'll we'll wait and see, right? But I don't I don't have a direct answer to that question because it would be speculative. Thanks, Scott. That was some great opinions and mixed in there too. I'm going to, I have a question here from KJ and I'll make it our last question. Just we have time to wrap up. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll put this to you um, first. Anyway, um, are there disadvantages to paying cash on close 
to cash and close deals when considering purchasing a smaller business. So if you if you have the way I understand this is if you have the ability to pay cash on close and, and close without vendor financing or an earnout, is there a disadvantage to doing that and and not structuring um, earnouts and and uh, VTBs vendor financing? Yen, uh, we don't. We're not usually involved in the negotiation of how you pay L. Um, but I think all in all, the value is um, is what it is. It's just the cost of, you know, if you're able to borrow at a good, um, so you kind of like, you compare that paying cash now with like financing with 6% from the bank, what the value of that is, right? So with that cash, whether you put that, you can earn six, seven percent versus borrowing. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see um, a disadvantage. Um, the earn out is more to kind of like bridge the gap between the expectation or negotiating with the um, the, the the seller. Um, what's your perspective on that, Scott? Yeah, I, I mean, I have, I have an opinion on this. I suppose. Paying all cash gives you one benefit, and that is that you could probably do a better job of negotiating lower price when it's all cash at close. So that because when the seller gets all cash at close, 100% of their risk has been removed from the table. And that's something that they're looking for. And a lot of them are driving towards that. So if they are comparing offers and one has some weird, funky structure to it and yours is all cash, they're likely going to be leaning towards yours that's all cash. So I'd say that is, that's probably the primary advantage. Uh, the disadvantage of it is your cash, why not keep it, right? Like if they're, if they're open to a vendor note or if they're open or if, you know, you can use the bank's money, once you're using the bank's money or using the vendor note, the company that you just acquired is now servicing that debt and it's buying the business for you. So that's normally how buyers will look at a deal. How much do I have to put in myself? And again, like it's 30% fine. That's the, your personal capital that you put at risk is the 30%. And the remainder of it is now being purchased. The business is essentially being purchased over time. The lending institution that you borrowed off of or the vendor that you borrowed off of the seller themselves, then they're actually have a bit of that risk that they're carrying. So the risk is a little bit more spread. But the more appealing thing about it is, is the business itself is now paying for the acquisition. And we anyway, I know we've, we've hit our time clock. It says the buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to cut you off there. You were on a roll. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for everyone that joined us today. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Scott and, and Yen, both of you, your insight and your opinions are so valuable. Um, again, a reminder for anyone who's not currently a subscriber, we have a 20% off discount for our annual memberships that'll be valid until midnight at Friday. If you're interested, um, we'll also honor that if you just want to book a call to chat with us, we'll continue to honor, honor the membership discount. So uh, that's a wrap for us and, and watch for the email that will come to everyone who participated today with the recording as well as the discount and, and the discount code is also in the chat as well. So um, again, hope this, this presentation was valuable to everyone. Um, if you have any comments as well, please feel free to put them in the chat and we can share those with the presenters, with the panelists. Um, and they always like to hear, hear people's feedback on, on the conversation. So again, thank you everyone for joining us today and we hope to see you again. We do these monthly now um, and they're always run as a panel discussion format with just chitter chatter back and forth. Um, and we, we will Welcome you all to come and join us again. Great. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Thank you, Yen. Everyone. Thanks, Yen. Bye-bye. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Yeah.